Hello, welcome to another episode of Jib's 2011 Audiobooks and Music. Reading Fear by Eliza Scotland. Chapter 7. And maybe a few chapters after that. Fear by Eliza Scotland. Chapter 7. The conference room went dead, and Mary hadn't known she could feel worse, but she did. She was dumbfounded that John wanted to leave the firm, and would badmouth them that, and would badmouth them that way. Judy and Anne looked equally astonished that they had. Utterly blindsided, and now reporters would run with the story that was new evidence against them, damaging their case. There could be no doubt that John had done it, because he looked stricken, looked guilt stricken to Mary, and she should know because she was a guilt expert. Benny didn't rant and rave, but merely folded her arms, still leaning against the door. You need to explain this to us right now, she said, with controlled anger. I'm sorry, John rose hastily, as if about to address the court, which in a way he was, and Judge Rosado wasn't having any. So that reporter's question was true. You did make a statement that you would never make partner here because you're not a woman? Yes, that's true. Why didn't you tell us this before the press conference? I didn't think it would come up, John answered defensively. You let us get blindsided. You let us walk into it. How did I know the reporter would know? People talk in this town. These reporters have sources. They cultivate them. That's their job. How naive are you, Foxman? I didn't see it coming. You didn't see it coming. Benny's temper flared. But she paused, composing herself. Okay, let's begin at the beginning. I want you to tell the facts, and all the facts, so that we don't ever get surprised again. What gave rise to you making that comment? So this is exactly what happened and why. John licked his dry lips. You know that antitrust matter, London Technologies, if you remember? When you got the case, you assigned the case to Anne and me. And we met the clients, Jim and Sanjay. After the meeting, I asked if I could be lead counsel because I'm an antitrust expert. Benny didn't bat an eye, and Mary wondered if she would ever be able to say that she was an expert in anything so easily. Except guilt, but that didn't count. But you said no, John swallowed visibly, his Adam's apple almost getting caught on his cutaway collar. You made Ann lead counsel. Just about then, you made Judy partner. And I saw the writing on the wall. I didn't think you would promote me the way you do the others, and I started to look around for another job. Let me make one thing crystal clear. 
Benny glowered, but remained in control. I made Anne lead counsel on London Technologies because she was senior to you, not because she was a woman. John frowned. But I've tried other antitrust cases than she has. She hasn't tried a single one. Anne was about to say something, but Benny waved her into silence. Mary knew Anne would be seething and didn't blame her. Anne was a superstar lawyer, slated to become the next partner at the firm. She earned it through talent and hard work. But she had lived a life of people underestimating her brains because of her looks, which were so gorgeous that she'd put herself through law school working as a catalog model. Still, she'd become a great girlfriend to Mary and Judy, who had come to realize that hating on pretty girls was just plain mean. Benny continued, That's not the point, Foxman, and it's not your decision. It's my client, and I make the decision. In addition, after we had our initial meeting with Jim and Sanjay, it was clear to me that they liked Anne. In fact, they told me as much afterward. Only because of her looks, John shot back. They were crushing on her, it was obvious. Anne's mouth dropped open. How dare you? John put up his hands defensively. And I'm not saying that you intentionally used your looks. I'm saying that's part of your appeal. You know that. Everybody knows it. You're hot. It helps. Appearances matter. That's why you bought those clothes. Not everything is merit-based, even in business, and when you got the case instead of me, I didn't think it was merit-based. It was, John, and shot back angered, angering. Benny interjected, Murphy, don't start, and ignore Benny rising. John, are you freaking kidding me? It doesn't matter if I tried an antitrust case. How many people have? They're massive, and they almost never try. London Technologies isn't going to try either. Murphy, let me deal. Benny waved to get Anne's attention, but Mary knew it wouldn't help. Anne was a redhead, which is a blonde with poor impulse control. And I can read the substantive law as well as you, because that's what any lawyer does in every case. And you may act like you're the brain behind the case, but believe it or not, I'm the real live lawyer. Not Lawyer Barbary. Lawyer Barbie. Murphy, let me... And as for Jim and Sanjay, maybe in the beginning... They liked my looks, but I ignored that and they got over it. That happens all the time and I deal with it on my own because nobody feels sorry for the pretty girl. Now Jim and Sanjay respect me for my work and it's really sad that you don't. And while we're on the subject, Murphy let John, I tell you, your problem is that you don't like T. 
taking orders from women. You don't like it when I tell you what to do. Even though I'm Lee Counsel, you resist me. You don't listen. You come back at me telling me that we don't need whatever I want. For example, in London Tech, I didn't want to hire McManus. I told you to start over and get us permanent, a permanent associate. Instead, you ignored me, got a contract lawyer, and got a contract lawyer. If I were a man, you'd respect me. You'd do what I say when I say it. No question. Murphy! I don't even think you like, like it that the partners in this firm are female. You're the sexist, not us. And anyway, whatever you think, you have a hell of a hell of a nerve bad mouthing us around town. Hell of a nerve. Murphy enough. Benny opened the conference room door. You made your point. But I think you should go. Anything we say is dis discoverable, and you don't need to be part of it. Thank you very much. Fine, I get it. Anne stopped toward the door, her glossy hair flying. I'm out. Mary felt terrible seeing Anne and John at odds. Choosing opposite sides. She used to think that John liked it here. But she had been wrong. They had never turned on each other before. And it had always been Rosado and Denuncio against the world. The fight forced her to accept the reality that their happy little firm might be a thing of the past. Benny closed the door and returned her attention to John. Let's get back to the facts. I'd like to know which statements you made with regard to your feelings that we discriminated against you. John winced. I didn't say that, and really, I don't think that. But you said something like it. Yes. What did you say exactly? Benny shot back in cross-examination mode. I don't know. Just basically what the reporter said. That I don't think I'll make proper... That I don't think I'll make partner at Rosado. Because I'm not a woman. John grimaced. But really, I don't think that you discriminate per se. Benny's eyes flared. That's the definition of discrimination per se. I don't really think it, not really. I just say, I just said it. I should have thought before I spoke. I didn't know enough. Benny caught him off with a hand chop. To whom did you say that? The firms that interviewed me? Who? How many firms? John hesitated. I have to think about that. Were there that many? No, I just have to think. I don't remember them off the top of my head. Listening, Mary felt a wave of sadness. She hated seeing John on the spot, and she hated what he was saying. She glanced at Judy, who was biting her lip, her head tilted down. Mary knew she would be feeling responsible, 
since she was closest to him. Foxman, how could you not remember? You don't know? You don't know where you applied? Okay, blustered. John raised a hand. I know Hunter and Logue and Berger Jin. I'd have to think of the others. I sent the resume to a headhunter, and he's the one who put it out there. Which headhunter? Dean Slovak? You contacted Dean? Or he contacted you? He contacted me. Did he have a job opening in mind, or... He was just fishing. He didn't say, but he called me after Judy made partner. It was my lowest point, and I just sent the resume. When was this exactly? A few months ago. I have to check my calendar. Do you remember which firm or firms you made the statement to? It was Hunter and Laug, I'm pretty sure. Did you say that at more than one firm? I have to think about it, but I don't think so, John hesitated. They asked why I wanted to leave, so I had to give the reason. Benny folded her arms. Did you give all of them that reason? No, only Hunter. And how do you know that? Because I was most interested in Hunter. They needed to fill a position on a new antitrust matter, and that appealed to me. So we talked in more depth. With whom did you interview? Do you remember? I know most of the guys. Sure, Mark Jacobowitz. Benny looked as if she were about to say something, then kept it to herself, but Mary knew how upset she would be inside. John's statement not only damaged their case, it embarrassed all of them. Even Mary hated to think that John would say that about her around town. It wasn't true, and she knew tons of people in the legal community. Her reputation mattered, especially in Philly. Benny continued, So Mark's the one you made the comment to. You're not sure if you said it to anybody else. I don't think I did. Did you interview with anyone at Hunter besides Mark? Yes, an associate. What was his name? It was Mark's son, Bradley. Did you make the comment to Bradley too? Oops. Yes, I forgot about him. I guess I felt comfortable with him. Mary had no idea how they would get mitigate the damage, how they would mitigate the damage, and she was angry at the unfairness of the accusation. They hadn't discriminated against John because he was a man, and he wasn't senior enough to be a partner yet. Meanwhile, Hunter and Laug was an all-male firm, but nobody thought that was discriminatory. That was the status quo. Benny pursed her lips. 
Did you take notes after any of these interviews? No. Did you exchange emails in connection with any of these interviews? Yes. I'd like to have copies of them. Sure thing, John said, his tone turning agreeable. I also talked to Mark about the possibility of partnership in the next year. He said that was definitely something they would consider. Did Hunter make you an offer? Yes. And what did you do? I declined. Why? John flushed slightly. The pay was lower. <laughs> Benny said with elaboration. Are you negotiating with them? No, we were too far apart. Did anyone else make any offers? I haven't heard back yet, John sighed, sensing his cross-examination over. Benny, as I said before, I think I should resign. I wish you wouldn't. Why? I mean... How can I work here anymore? John raised his hand in appeal, obviously at, at a loss. How can you not? If you leave, it will confirm the reporter's story, which we did not do in real time. And it leaves a huge gaping hole in our London Technologies case. I don't know how we can stage that litigation without you. Benny gazed at him evenly. Bottom line, the best way to mitigate the damage to this firm is for you to work here and for us not to speak of this anymore. But it's your choice and I leave it to you. I'd like to think about it. That is your right and privilege. Benny opened the conference room door. Now, if you'll give us some time in private. Again, I'm very sorry to everyone, John said to Mary and Judy, then headed for the door. Benny let, let him out and closed the door behind him. Well, 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 she said, exhaling heavily. We have an enemy in our midst. Judy sighed miserably. He's not our enemy, is he? Yes, but no matter. Benny's eyes glittered. Let's take a page from Machiavelli's book. Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. We can deal. Mary looked up, worried sick. What do we know? I mean, what do we do now? We review the documents and try to understand the facts of our own case. Benny gestured at the credenza. Where she had put the documents that John had given her. In other words, we get to work. Ugh. I am so sorry, Judy leaned back in her chair as if pressed by some unseen weight. I can't believe he did this. Carrier, it's not your fault. Benny slid her phone from her blazer pocket. Let's call Lao Tzu. Before he reads it online. Chapter 8. A copper sun dimmed. A copper sun dipped behind the flat roofs. Satellite disc and trolley wires that hung over South Philly like an urban canopy. And Mary braced herself before... She went into her parents' house. 
She wished she could have gone straight home after the long afternoon at work, but her parents wanted to see her more often now, now that she was pregnant which had upgraded her already lofty status as amazing daughter to that of magical grandchild vessel. To that of a magical grandchild vessel. Her parents, Vita and Maddie Denunzio, lived on Mercy Street, which was lined on either side by two-story red brick houses, red brick row houses, differentiated by the color of their shutters, generally black. The railing on their front stop, on their front stoops, wrought iron preferred, and. The contents of their bay window, eagles, fillies, or flyers, paraphernalia required. Religious, statuary optional. Virgin Mary always on point. Mary had grown up in this house with its scroll work D in the metal screen door like all the other neighbors when she was little she thought it stood for door until she realized it stood for denunzio detuno and detizio because back then everybody was Italian American. Nowadays, the screen doors had changed, but people were still the same, which was the way of South Philly, if not the towel. Marie, is that you on a stoop? Her father shouted through the screen door because his hearing aid plugged his hearing because his hearing aid plugged his ear like a plastic cork insul insulating him from all sound. Yes, Pop Mary opened the door and entered the long rectangular house which was so stuffed with people that it reminded her of a that it reminded her of a manicotti with too much ricotta filling her father was watching the Phillies game with her husband Anthony Rattuno and her father's three best best friends, the Tonys. <laughs> Tony from down the block, La Monaco, Pigeon Tony, Lucia, and Tony, two feet. Pensiera, whose nickname had a nickname, Family Feet, Namely Feet. They were both honorary uncles and hung out at the house like a octogenarian street gang. Beyond the living room was the kitchen, which held her mother and her mother-in-law, Elvira, or Elvira, who Mary secretly called 
Elvirus. Or virus. Most people would think that a kitchen with two women wasn't as full as living with wasn't as full as living as a living room with five men, but these two women mean that the kitchen was not only dangerously over occupancy but possibly thermonuclear. Mary's mother and Elvira were as different as old school and no school, but lately they'd been getting along unusually well, both counting down to the birth of their grandchild. Coming soon from the uterus near you. Hey, honey. Her husband, Anthony, came over smiling. His warm smile. Her husband. Her husband. Anthony came over smiling his warm smile, his espresso hued eyes meeting hers. Telegraphing, I know you're beat, but we'll get through this together. Then giving her a big hug. Hi, love you. Mary hugged him back, melting into the comfort of his arms and soft oxford shirt she knew he must have heard about the lawsuit against them though she hasn't had a spare minute to text him since they had worked all afternoon preparing their answers and discussing it with roger on the phone luckily her parents and the tonys didn't go online except Tony from down the block who supplemented his social security playing pokerstars.com. Mayor, how you doing? How you feel? Come and sit down. Her father grabbed Mary and hugged her, and the Tonys clustered around her like a cloud of cigar smoke and Bengay fumes. Mare, you're getting bigger every day, feet patted her belly, and Mary didn't stop him. Everybody in the family touched her belly, and she figured it was preparing the baby for Denunzio world. Where you had, where you had to hug and kiss everybody any time you left the room. Mary, it's so good to see you, Tony, from down. The block took her right arm. You feeling okay? Maria, Maria. Pigeon Tony took her other arm, leading her into the kitchen where she was love attacked by her mother. Maria, come sit down. Her mother tugged her into the kitchen and placed her bodily in a seat at the table, which was already set for dinner. Honey, you look so tired. Elvira hustled over with a full plate of ravioli covered in tomato sauce or gravy in South Philly speak. 
You gotta eat something or you're gonna faint. Mare. Elvira's picked up Mary's fork, stabbed a ravioli, and was just about to try to put in Mary's mouth when Anthony intercepted the fork. Ma, stop. She can feel, she can feed herself. Anthony set the fork down on Mary's plate. But aunt, look at her. She looks so tired. She looks fine, Anthony said, patting Mary's arm. Tony from down the block said, I think she looks good. Feet said, I think she looks good too. Of course she does. She's gorgeous. Mary smiled at her father, but let the others talk, having grown accustomed to everyone discussing her as if she weren't in the room, deciding what she would do, what she should and shouldn't do, what she should and shouldn't eat, or whether she should or shouldn't work, exercise, or otherwise exist. El Elviras was saying, Mary, are you blind? Take a good look at your daughter. Her face is white as a ghost. Anthony looked over at his mother. Mom, she's not sick. She's pregnant. Right. Mary managed another smile, but sometimes pregnant felt like sick. Though it would have been politically incorrect to say so, Elviras waved him off. Her gelled nails, thickly red like a manicured vulture. Anthony, you're a man. You don't know. I fainted all the time carrying you and your brother. She has to eat for her blood sugar. Her blood sugar is fine, Anthony sat down as Mary's father. And the Tony settled into their seat and began passing the steaming platter of ravioli, which trailed an aroma of tomatoes, oregano, and fresh basil. Mary's mother hovered, waiting for Mary to need something before she sat down. Dressed in her flowery house dress. With her authoritic fingers forming a gnarled ball at her wrist. And her gray hair teased to cover her bald spot. Maria, drink some water. You gotta drink. I will, Ma. Drink. Look, see? Mary raised the water glass and took a sip, like a drinking demonstration, and her mother smiled, leaning over, giving her a kiss on the cheek and a little back rub. Love you, Kara. Love you too, Ma. So good you so good you come home. I'm happy too, Mary kept her smile on, feeling guilty that she didn't mean it completely. Her mother loved her to the morrow, 
as did her father and the Tonys, and her family meant everything to her. But she had such a horrible day at work, with the firm being sued, the press conference that went sideways, and the fighting between John and Anne, that everything suddenly seemed like too much, and on top of her pregnancy. Mare, you need to take it easy. You work too hard, Elveras pulled up a chair and pulled up a chair next to Mary. Her opium perfume was as thick as tomato sauce. Mary tried not to breathe in newly sensitive to smells. But the scent was her mother-in-law's trademark, along with her jet-black shag, bedazzled skinny jeans, and white tank top that read, World's Best Grandma. It struck Mary that her mother-in-law dressed such dressed much younger, while her mother dressed much older. In the stop-time tradition of the denuncios, Mary looked around, seeing the kitchen with new eyes. Everything was from another era, the dented spaghetti pot and coffee and the coffee percolator had to be 50 years old. And her mother didn't own a garbage disposal or dishwasher, still doing the dishes by hand and collecting the slop in a metal bin in the sink. An old church calendar faded on the wall with a washed-out Jesus Christ-looking heavenward. Or maybe rolling his eyes, undoubtedly wondering why her parents had no air conditioning but still used a fan, which whirred away on the kitchen counter. Evenly distributing the humidity, the mass cards tucked behind the switchblade with dried palm were the only thing that ever changed here. Growing in number as their relatives and friends passed away, Vita and Matt D'Annunzio were getting older, and Mary felt the years closing in along with everything else. Tony from down the block tucked his napkin in his t-shirt collarbone like an adult bib, which Mary happened to know he had he had on with his adult diapers. So like a one-man circle of life. He said, he said she should quit work. That's what I think. She shouldn't work while she's pregnant. Si, si, el, el vero. Si, si, el vero. Pigeon Tony nodded, his bald head already deeply tanned since he spent so much time outside with his homing pigeons. Feet pushed his Mr. Potato Head glasses, clucking. Mayor, you gotta slow down. It's crazy. It's too much. She likes to work. She's got a business to run. Feet frowned. 
His milky brown eyes magnified by his bifocals. But she can't work right up to the time the baby comes. Sure I can, I'm fine. Mary glanced at Anthony, who was looking down at his plate as he ate. Elvidas pointed at Mary's food. Mare, eat. Her mother nodded, watching Mary. Maria! Mangia! I got it, Ma. Mary tried not to sound testy, picking up her fork. It seemed so... It seemed so Olive Garden that her mother actually said mangia. But some stereotypes ring true for a reason. She looked at her full plate and her stomach rumbled. She knew she should eat, but the tomato sauce and opium weren't mixing with the prig with the progesterone. Feet frowned. Mayor, when are you gonna quit work? When the doctor tells me to. Mary did didn't wanna have the discussion right now. She had been ducking this subject because it touched on a sore spot for her and Anthony. The subject made him feel terrible, since he didn't have a job. She wanted to keep working, and given their finances, she really didn't have a choice. Feet persisted. And then how much time are you going to take off? Like a year? Two years? I don't think that long, Mary answered, keeping, keeping it vague. But she noticed her mother eyeing her, chewing slowly. And her father blinking behind his glasses. Both of them had to be wondering what Mary and Anthony had planned, but she didn't want to make any announcement right now, especially not with the Tonys here. Elvira's brightened. Mary can go back to work right away. I'll babysit every day. It's no problem. I can't even wait. I already bought a playpen. Mary's mother pursed her lips. Elvira! I told you. I can make. I mean, I can take care. I can take care of the baby. Every day we'll come and sit. Right, we've got you covered, Mare. Me and your mother. I wonder if it will be a girl or a boy. Elvira glanced at Mary's mother sideways. Vita. Don't hog the baby. We'll have a schedule. I'll sit on Monday, Wednesdays, and Friday and you and you guys sit on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Mary's mother's eyes flared in indignation. So Mary stepped in. Ladies, let's not worry about it now. We still have two months to go. Feet interjected. Mary, how are you going to swing this at work? You're going to stay home with the baby, right? 
Mary was about to answer, but Anthony stiffened, cutting her off. No, he said coolly. That's not what we're planning. Mary's going back to work as soon as she feels ready, probably in a few weeks, and I'm going to stay home with the baby. Mary's mouth went dry. She wouldn't have gone there, but Anthony was on a roll. Turning to, turning to his mother. Mom, I appreciate your offer, but we don't need a babysitter at all. I'm going to take care of the baby full time. Anthony then faced Mary's mother with a smile. Vita, thank you so much for your offer to babysit, but I don't think we'll be needing you or Maddie on a daily basis either. What? Elvira's mouth dropped open. Okay? Mary's mother asked, frowning. Did he say he's gonna be the babysitter? The Tonys looked uniformly aghast. Feet set down his fork. Ain't you, aren't you the dad? Tony from down the block shook his head. And you mean you're going to be like the mom? Pigeon Tony spoke rapid Italian. And again, Mary got the gist, which was, women aren't supposed to stay home with babies. And women are supposed to stay home with babies. And men are supposed to go out and make money the way God intended. Also they can also they can have mistresses, but this might not be the time to bring that up. Mary didn't intend to argue with any of them. There was no point in trying to convince this very traditional group of men of anything remotely modern. Like the fact that women should have the vote. Meanwhile, she could see her father getting with the program, his gaze softening. He slumped in his white t-shirt and his eyebrows sloped down behind his glasses. He'd been a tile setter his working life. But his blocky build had changed as he aged, his broad shoulders worn and time like rocks. Even though he was uneducated, he was no dummy. And despite appearance and despite appearances and despite appearances, he was the more he was the more intuitive of her parents. Mary was a daddy's girl from the way back. Her father's soft gaze shifted to the Tonys. Guys, you're not too old fashioned. Men can be moms too. Nowadays, it's the new thing. It's okay. It happens. Feet nodded. I know, I've heard that. Hell, I got those guys across the street. They're gay, and the one dad <laughs> stays home with the baby, and the other dad goes to work. If you got two dads, you gotta have a dad staying home. You got no choice. Tony from down the block shrugged. Whatever floats your boat. 
and Vilas turned to Anthony in bewilderment. But honey, when do we get the baby? Mary's mother nodded, equally confused. Si cuando, Maria. Mary had to derail this before the moms lost their mind. Ma, Elvira, listen. Of course you'll get to see the baby. You'll come over to our house and we'll come over to your house. You'll get to see the baby plenty. You just don't have to babysit every day. Anthony added, Exactly. It goes without saying that you'll see the baby. We want you to see the baby and we want you in the baby's life. But my staying home makes the most sense for Mary and me, and that's what we're going to do. Mm. Elvira sucked in her teeth. I don't like the sound of this. Ayora! Mary's mother said under her breath. And Mary knew her mother wasn't happy. Ayora could mean... Arr, sheesh, or we'll see about that. And in this case, it meant all of the above. Mary, I hate to change the subject, but I gotta ask. I heard some crazy news from from Kamar Annie. She heard it from the from the chicken Jimmy who heard it from his sister Denise who heard it on the TV from Denise Nakano. The one you said is Japanese, not Chinese. What? Mary asked, worrying that dinner was about to go from bad to worse. Nobody in South Philly needed the internet because they already had the neighborhood. I heard that your law firm is getting, that your law firm is getting sued. Is that right? That can't be right, can it? Mary cringed inwardly. Yes, that's true. We got the papers today. Holy gosh, what the hell for? Mary picked her ra picked at her ravioli. We're being sued for reverse sex discrimination. Huh? What are you talking about? Father's eyes flew open, cataracts edging his brown eyes like <clears throat> advancing storm clouds. You can't do that, can you? That's not legal. Mayor, for real, some guy is suing you because you're all girls? Tony from down the block wiped his chin. Remember, we're not an all-woman firm anymore. We have John Foxman, a male lawyer. And we also have Lou Jacobs, a male investigator. Feet recoiled, blinking. I can't get over this. That's not gentlemanly. What kind of man sues women? That's like hitting a woman. Who does such a thing? Disgrazia. Pigeon Tony frowned deeply, speaking Italian so quickly that Mary couldn't translate fast enough. Though she got the gist again, 
which was, I will kill anybody who hurts you, Mary. What court will... What court would let you get sued for that, Mayor? The judge will throw the case out, won't he? Maddie, stop asking her questions, Elvidas. Moved Mary's plate closer to her. Mayor, don't talk. Eat. Her mother looked worried behind her glasses. Maria, what's the matter? You know, like, you want some soup, some crackers? No, thanks. I'm fine, Ma, Mary said, stabbing a ravioli. Pop, it's a ridiculous lawsuit, but we'll win. Don't worry. Nick Machiavelli's on the other side, so you know the whole thing's a sham. You'll get it thrown out. Machiavelli is a... Is a cavone. Is a cavone. Or is it just cavone? Right. Feet nodded. Sure she will. Mary's a great lawyer. Tony from down the block nodded, chewing. You'll win, Mary. You always do. The phony's got nothing on you. Right, her father's, her father's gaze. Full of love and Mary's across the table. Everything's gonna be all right, honey. I know, Pop, Mary said. And for a second, she almost believed it was true. Hello, this is Manowizar, a.k.a. Jupes 2011, <sighs> reading Chapter 9 of Feared by Liza Scotland. After dinner was over, Mary and Anthony cruised in their Prius through the Warren streets that was South Philly. Mary began to relax, the fatigue of the day catching up with her. The car interior was dark and cool. She rested her head back on the headrest, content to let herself be driven. She always loved that Anthony knew the neighborhood as well as she did, and he could navigate the crazy matrix of one-way streets. Luckily, there was almost no traffic, and the motion of the car lulled her into drowsiness. That went well, Anthony said after a moment, and Mary opened her eyes, realizing that she'd almost fallen asleep. What did? You know, breaking the news that I'm going to be staying home with the baby. I was surprised that you did, Mary said, realizing that it wasn't the best thing to say after the words left her lips. Somebody had to. Anthony looked over in the darkness, and Mary couldn't make out his features, but she knew from his tone of voice he was hurt. I didn't mean it to be critical. It sounded critical. It wasn't. I'm just tired. Mary felt it was the truest sentence she had ever spoken all day, and maybe even for the past seven months. Okay, whatever. Anthony fell silent watching the light change from green to red. I know it shouldn't bother me, but it does. What does? You know that I'm the one staying home. 
Mary sighed inwardly. Don't let the Tonys get to you. They're from a different place in time. You know that. I know, but still. Anthony hit the gas. I'm only staying home because it makes the most sense for all of us. I know that, and I appreciate it. As soon as my book is finished, I'm hoping I can find a publisher. I know that, too. Then maybe we can get an Annie, or let our mothers do it, or whatever. Right, we'll see how it goes. Mary wished she could make it all right for him, but she couldn't. And part of the problem was how guilty she felt. Because he had turned down a big teaching job at UCLA for her. So she didn't have to move away from Philadelphia. I mean, obviously I'm excited about the baby and all. And I love being home with him. Or her. Of course you will. But it wasn't the plan. Obviously it's not the plan. No. Right. Mary bit her tongue. She had heard him say this before, but she never knew how to react. Truth to tell, it wasn't the plan for her either. She would have loved to have stayed home with the baby for more than a few weeks. She'd always envisioned herself as an at-home mother, at least for a time. But they got pregnant sooner than they expected, so they had to compromise. And like any good settlement, neither side was completely happy. <clears throat> I don't even know if I'll be good at it. Of course you will, Mary said to soothe him. You'll be a great dad. But will I be a great mom? You're kidding, right? Yes. Anthony chuckled. Seriously, don't buy in. You don't have their ideas of what women do and men do. Please don't let it make you crazy or, or me. I won't. We're better than that. We're smarter than that. I know, Anthony paused, but your parents get to me. I feel bad in front of them, ashamed. Why, honey? Mary asked, hurt for him. Anthony shrugged, his dark gaze looking out into the night. Obviously, I wish I had been able to provide for you so your father wouldn't worry or your mother. Ah, oh, honey, don't be that way. They love you and that's all that matters. They know you're amazing and great, and when you sell your book, things will change. But why if I don't sell it? You will. But what if I don't? Anthony repeated, and Mary knew the anxiety was deep-seated for them both. Then you'll write another one, or another job offer will come up. Neither way, we'll have each other and a beautiful little baby girl. Anthony managed to smile. A welcome shadow in the dark car. Hold on, I thought you said it was a boy. You said it felt like a boy. 
I changed my mind. Mary smiled back. At this point, I don't care if it's a girl or boy. Anthony recoiled. What? You want a girl? Not anymore. Either way, I'll get, I'll get sued. Anthony laughed. You still want a boy? No. Liar. Truly, I'll take either. That's the kind of mom I am. Please. I've had enough gender politics for one day with, litig with this litigation. Mary let her thoughts cycle back to the answer, which they had spent the afternoon drafting. I'll probably have to go in tomorrow to do some research on the case. But it's Saturday. I don't have a choice, Mary said, not wanting to fight. She and Anthony got along so beautifully, but the only thing they fought over was how much she worked. Yet another role. Reversal. So Machiavelli's really suing the firm. Yes, did you see the press conference? I caught it online. And yours too. Oh, that must have been terrific. Mary shuddered. Can we not talk about it? It was... It was a debacle. The whole thing is a debacle. On the plus side, you looked pretty. So did Benny. Less Amazonian than usual. Mary smiled. And made us... And made... Us up. Like my new dress. Like my new dress? How much did it cost? The firm paid for it. Then I love it, Anthony sighed. You really have to go in tomorrow? Can't you slack? It's been long, it's been so long since we've had a lazy weekend. There's not that many more left before the baby comes. I can't, honey. Mary put her hand on his leg. The lawsuit is too important. He named us as individual defendants. Didn't you know that? Wait, what? Anthony barked at the light, and Mary could see his alarmed frown. He's suing us under a law that enables him to sue the three partners personally. Does that mean what I think it means? If you lose, we pay it personally? Yes, Mary answered, kicking herself. She knew that she knew that Anthony worried about money, which she understood, but she was in no mood. How would we pay? How much? What damages are they asking? It's unclear at this point. But they have to ask for damages in the complaint, don't they? No, it's not a complaint that you file in court where damages are specified. It's an, it's an administrative complaint filed with the Pennsylvania the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission so how much can they get if they win 
like 10 grand or 50 or 100 grand it's hard to say because we don't can't you ballpark it no because there's too many variables what are you a contractor Anthony scoffed give me a number I have a right to know, don't I? Okay, let me think. Mary had been calculating it in her head for the mo for most of the afternoon. Though she, Judy, and Benny kept coming up with different totals since damages in failure to hire case were notoriously hard to calculate. It's three plaintiffs who say they weren't hired because they're men. Let's assume that we lose. Mary felt sick at the thought alone. The way to make them whole is to award them what they would have earned if they had gotten a job for a reasonable for a reasonable period of years are you serious that's the theory mary hated getting into the weeds with him we never should have said anything i mean she sh she never should have said anything So, if the going rate for an associate is 70 grand a year and they were wrongly denied that pay, then that's three plaintiffs at 70 grand a year, probably for five years. And are you kidding me? That's over a million dollars. Anthony slammed on the brakes harder than necessary. I know. Mary had to admit it sounded scary to her, too. But I would only pay a third of it. So? Where are we going to get that kind of money? Especially now. We're not going to lose, Anthony. But where will we get the money if we did? You said yourself, you have to assume you lose. So, where do we get that money? Anthony threw up his hands. We have a killer mor mortgage. I told you the house was a reach. We're doing fine with the mortgage. Mary held her tongue. The new house had been a bone of contention too, but she bought it with her savings. So she made the down payment. They would have been on the easy. They would have been on Easy Street, but for the fact that she'd gotten pregnant and gotten sued, not in that order. Mary, this is a disaster! Anthony shook his head as he drove. I didn't realize you're getting sued personally. I know, it's unusual. We think that's why Machiavelli chose to sue under the, under the statute. Under the stat, stat, statute. In fact, he manufactured the whole case. It doesn't matter how it began. It only matter how it ends. Well, we don't know that yet, now do we?
No, but we know that. Anthony shot back, newly agitated. We cannot get another loan to pay off any judgment against us. Okay, so well when? You better. So maybe I should work tomorrow. Mary asked dryly. I'll pack your lunch, Anthony shot back. Suddenly, suddenly Mary's phone rang and she pulled it from her purse and checked the screen to see a FaceTime call from Machiavelli, which wasn't a complete surprise. It was his modus operandi to call her during their cases, like a kindergartner with his mother's phone. She tent she said to Anthony, guess who? Anthony glanced over. Him? You don't have to answer it. Yes, I do. You never know. Mary pressed the button to take the call. And Nick Machiavelli appeared on the screen. He was handsome in a vaguely seductive way. Like Satan with a law degree. <laughs> he wore his black hair slicked back. And his eyes were narrow slits. With dark brown irises that burned with intensity even on the phone. His nose was strong and his jawline was strong. If pugnacious, if pugnacious, he dressed like a mobster who shopped at Neiman Marcus. And though he dated plenty of women, Mary could barely set her hatred aside to talk to him. Hey, Mare, how was dinner? Machiavelli asked with a cocky smile. Why are you calling? Mary didn't bother to hide her disdain. Machiavelli had his minions everywhere in the neighborhood, so he probably didn't have to guess that she'd been at her parents' house. She and Machiavelli were like the Good witch and the bad witch of South Philly. How are your parents doing? None of your business. How's Anthony? Also, not your concern. Tell him I said congratulations on the new baby. <clears throat> Anthony flipped him the bird. Though it was off screen, Mary was losing patience. What are you calling about, Machiavelli? And you know I hate it when you FaceTime me. Which is why I do it, Machiavelli grinned. Also, it's fun. Work should be fun, Mary, don't you think? Is this about the case? If so, get to the point. If not, I'm hanging up. You guys ready to settle? Machiavelli's smile evaporated, which reminded Mary that he never did anything without a purpose. Despite his joking around, he was deadly serious when he wanted something. And this time he wanted to destroy her and her firm. No settlement ever. And as you know, I'm a defendant in the suit you field, not a lawyer. And you're not permitted to communicate with me directly. We hired a lawyer. 
He should have sent you a letter already. Roger Vitez, that hippie? He did, but I like you better. This is the last call I'm taking from you. Think about settling, Mayor. Don't be stubborn. I know how you get. No, you don't. You guys are going down. Remains to be seen. Machiavelli chuckled. Isn't that from the magic eight ball? No, that would be reply hazy. Try again. It's not going to get worse from here, Mayor. I mean, it's going to get worse from here, Mayor. Your press conference was a fiasco. I got you dead to rights. Your firm's been getting away with murder for too long. It's against the law to hire only women. We boys deserve a break today. Oh, please, Mary said, ending the call. She tried not to let it get to her, but she felt shaken. The stakes were high and Machiavelli stopped at nothing. Babe, Anthony said softly. Yes? Mary looked over. Anthony smiled grimly. Beat his ass. Fear by Liza Scotland Chapter 10 Mary rode upward in the elevator late on her way into the office because she had stopped to get bagels and cream cheese for everybody. Even pregnant, she couldn't imagine working on the weekend without a food reward. She pulled up her maternity pants, trying to situate them comfortably on her belly. They were only, they were the only thing more annoying than maternity dresses. And she'd been horrified, and she'd been horrified by this pair. Ugly white leg jeans with a big swath of black elastic in the belly. As if someone had taken a black sharpie around the equator. The elevator doors opened and she stepped into the office and trundled through the empty reception hall, breathing heavily. She felt like the little train that could <laughs> and, and puffing along. I think I can. I think I can. <laughs> but truth to tell, Mary had felt that way even before her pregnancy. She <laughs> she'd always had to give herself pep talks, telling herself that she could do whatever it was that she was afraid of. And happily, she'd been right most of the time. This time she worried she was up against her biggest challenge. Her thoughts turning away. Mary walked down the hallway, turning, the conf turning toward the conference room where she knew the others would be waiting. For the first time ever, she had to admit 
that her stress levels were maxing out. <clears throat> Anthony had barely spoken to her before they fell asleep last night, and she left early enough so they only had time for a quick breakfast. She was as worried as he was about the possibility that they could lose the lawsuit, which could put them into personal bankruptcy. Not only that, but she was worried about whether this was the end of Rosado and Denuncio. It seemed impossible, but the stakes couldn't be higher. Oh, Mary said, surprised, as she arrived at the threshold of the conference room. She had expected Benny and Judy, who were sitting in the conference table in t-shirt and jeans. But catty corner to them was Roger Vitez, dressed like a Steve Jobs wannabe again. In, in what looked like fresh black turtle. In what looked like a fresh black turtleneck and jeans. And he sat next to a younger sandy haired man in rim in rimless glasses who was dressed like a Vitez wannabe. <laughs> oh gosh, that's funny. Perfect timing, Denuncio. <clears throat> Benny flashed her a stiff smile but didn't look especially happy. And Judy jumped up came around the table and reached for the bag. Let me take that. Aren't you nice, Mary said, touched as she entered the conference room. No, just hungry. What did you bring? Lox and bagels. <clears throat> nice, thanks. You're going to be a great mom. I already am. Mary entered the room and sat down as Judy dug in the bag. <laughs> Benny gestured to Vitez. Denuncio, you know Roger. And with him is an associate of, it, of his, Isaac Chevy. Or Chevy. Spelled C-H-E-V-I. I think it's Chevy. Or Chevy. I'm just gonna say Chevy. Yeah. Hi, Roger. Isaac. I didn't know you guys would be here. Benny interjected. I only found out this morning. Roger smiled his zen smile. I thought I might come by since I'm allegedly your counsel. Okay, Mary said, not knowing what he meant. But then again, she was getting used to not knowing what he meant. <clears throat> she sat down in her chair while Judy distributed chubby locks and bagel sandwiches around the table, wrapped in waxed paper. But there were only three. I'm sorry I didn't get enough food. I would have, if I would known. Roger raised a hand. No need, we're fine. Thanks to Nunzio. Benny pulled her sandwich over, glanced at Roger. Why didn't you tell Mary what you were just telling us? I mean, why don't you tell Mary what you were just telling us? Sure. Roger linked his fingers in front of him the way he had before. And if he noticed that the air was being too reek of 
briny deli pickles, he didn't let it show. Mary, I was just telling Benny that I watched your press conference yesterday with dismay. More than a little dismay. Mary listened, trying to get used to the way he talked, which was odd. More than a little odd. Plus, he wasn't the kind of guy you could interrupt, and she was big on interrupting. She and Judy interrupted each other constantly. Not only could they finish each other's sentences, they could start them, which was a girlfriend thing. It demonstrated fairly clearly that from here on, we need to alter the way we, con we communicate with others. With respect to this case, you mean you want to change things? Mary asked, trying to translate, because we flunked the press conference. Judy looked over with a smile, her cheeks full of bagel. Dude, we're trying not to think about it in such a binary fashion. Pass and fail, thumbs up or thumbs down. It's not like that. Exactly, Roger said, pleased. Isaac is an employee of my firm, and he speaks with my voice. That must hurt, Mary said, just to make him laugh, but he didn't. Judy did, so she hadn't completely gone over to the dark side. Isaac has degrees in marketing and psychology, and he deals with our firm's communications. It is my sincerest wish... That from now on, and from now on, any and all communications with regard to the litigation go through him. And he speaks for all of us with one voice. Mary got the gist. So he's a PR guy. Roger flinched. Essentially. Bernie frowned. Denuncio to bring you up to speed, I was just telling Roger that I don't think we need a spokesperson. We know how to speak for ourselves. I agree, Mary said, for solidarity. And also, she did agree. Benny raised her chin. I haven't practiced law for decades to need to need a mouthpiece. I am a mouthpiece. Roger's cool gaze slid sideways to Benny. Need I point out that your maiden voyage didn't go quite as expected? We were sabotaged and Isaac would have been in the same position. We didn't know the question was coming. Isaac? Roger turned to Isaac. Would you have a res Would you have a response to that that you might want to share? Isaac nodded with a pat smile. Benny, this is no way this is in no way criticism of you or the way the conference went. Your point is well taken. However, as matter, as a matter of procedure, when we hold a meeting at any time with the press, everyone is required to sign in and identify themselves. Isaac kept his tone calm and even even in almost the exact same c 
cadence says Roger. Or cadence says Roger. And Mary had never heard anything like it, especially from a PR type or publicist. They all talked a mile a minute, which was a job requirement since everybody hung up on them. Isaac was saying, they're registered and they wear identifying badges during the event. In this way, we know exactly who is asking what question, which is important information. If we had, if we had run the conference, we would know who the reporter was who asked the question because clearly she has some information that we need. Benny sighed. Okay, good point, but still, I don't think we need you. Roger looked over at Benny. You don't like taking orders. No one ever gives me orders, so I don't know whether I, if I whether I like it or not. Roger smiled, cocking his head. And I'm betting that you don't like talk like taking orders from a man. I have never done that either. Benny smiled shyly, and Roger smiled back, and Mary wondered if this qualified as foreplay for lawyers. Meanwhile, Roger was barking up the wrong tree because Benny was totally in love with her boyfriend, Declan, who might have been the exact opposite of Roger in every way, namely that he talked normally. Roger leaned back in his chair. In any event, you hired me to represent you, and Isaac is part of my team, an essential part of my team. If you want me, he comes with. Oh, fine, Benny said irritably. And just then, Mary heard a noise behind her and turned to see John Foxman standing in the threshold of the conference room, dressed in a tie and, th and a three-piece gray suit. His forehead was knit, and there were dark circles underneath his eyes, as if he hadn't slept well. Hi, everyone, John said uncomfortably. I hope I'm not interrupting anything. Benny rose. Foxman, this is Roger Vitez and Isaac Chevy. She gestured. She gestured at John. Gentlemen, this is John Foxman. Pleased to meet you, Roger said, though he didn't rise, and neither did Isaac. Sorry to interrupt. I want to get this over with, so I just thought I would come in. John squared his shoulders. I reached a decision about whether I'm staying with the firm or going. Mary sighed inwardly. She wasn't ready for this yet. She needed carbohydrates. Or not to be pregnant. Judy set her sandwich aside. John, seriously? John avoided her gaze. Avoided her John avoided her eye, turning to Benny. Benny, this isn't easy, and I appreciate everything you've done for me. You know, I think the world of you and this firm and 
Benny interrupted him. What's your decision? I've decided to resign. I don't think I can work here any longer. And why is that, Benny shot back? Mary took it like a blow. She'd been sure that John was going to stay after Benny's pitch last night. Judy looked equally upset, her lips parting and her attention glued to John, but she didn't say anything. John sighed stiffly, his face a grim mask. It's not tenable, it's not tenable to stay here in view of my statements and my view, your view. The fact is, I made those statements, and they were the truth. I do feel out of place here, and even more so since the complaint was filed. John's expression softened. I truly don't think you discriminated against me, however, and I do think you would have made me partner one day, but those are counterfactuals. Now that the lawsuit has been filed, I don't think I can stay. Benny frowned. But what about the fact that this damages the case against us. We're parting ways, and the obvious conclusion after what happened is that the plaintiffs are correct on the facts, or that you've been, or that you've been outstood. Or outstood. I can't control the implication of what I do or what people infer, but I'll make it clear that this is my decision, not yours. I'll draft a statement that I'm resigning voluntarily and run it by you. Statement or no statement, the fact speaks for themselves. The, impl the implication is clear. It could even look like retaliation, Judy blurted out. John, this is a mistake. The complaint was just filed, and everybody's upset. It's going to settle down. Why don't you give it a week or two? See how you feel then. I don't think so, Judy. John shook his head. I'll feel the same way. It's a band-aid, and there's no reason to pull it off slowly. Mary felt an overwhelming sadness descend over her. She could see that John had made up his mind, and he was jumping the gun. John, Judy's right. Can't you just give it some time? I mean, I really loved getting to know you and working with you. John smiled at Mary softly. I appreciate your saying that. I really enjoy working with you too. But I have to go. And I don't want to delay. Benny interjected. John, how long are you planning on staying? A month? Two weeks? John hesitated. No, I'd like to re leave right away. Today. I have an interview across the town. I think the next two weeks are going to be really uncomfortable. There's no reason to put either side through that. Judy gasped. Either side? What are you talking about? Aren't we on the same side? 
course we are, John answered quickly. I meant all parties. Benny rose, surprised. But what about London Technologies? This is the worst possible time in the middle of discovery. We have 12 depositions to take and 16 to defend. There's even a dep to defend on Monday. How can you leave now? How is Anne going to handle that? She'll be fine. John shot back, resentment edging his tone. Benny glowered. And what about the client? Jim and Sanjay, my client. You have a responsibility to them too. You're here today, gone tomorrow? They prefer Anne anyway. They won't mind. John took a step toward Benny, extending a hand, then stopped, seeming to catch himself. Thank you for everything you've done for me, all of you. I wish you the best. I'll clean out my desk another time. I should go now. Judy stood up, upset. John, really, you're going to go just like that? Now? Mary half rose, not sure whether to hug him or let him go. Mary, don't get up, John said, waving her into her seat, flashing a sad smile at Judy as he headed toward the door. Judy, sorry. I think I should just go now. Goodbye, John. Benny called after him. Roger broke the silence, clearing his soap primely. <clears throat> Remain calm. Oh, shut up. Benny's head snapped around. Her face malted with anger. That, that he made the statement is bad enough. That he was interviewing with other firms is worse. That he's leaving now is a death blow and we'll have to scramble to cover him on London Technologies. I have no idea. How we'll staff that case. Roger merely blinked. I renew my recommendation that we initiate settlement negotiations. I told you no. I have your vote, but what about Mary and Judy? They are three Part, there are three partners here, not just one. Then he turned to Mary and Judy, momentarily, sh momentarily chastened. He's right, you guys. He's right. You guys get a say. Get to say what you think. You have an equal vote. Do you want to settle with that jerk? No settlement, Mary heard herself answering, her heart speaking for her. She knew how she felt despite the personal risk. Anthony might not agree, but luckily he wasn't here. I love John, but he's wrong. He didn't deserve to be made partner yet. It was too soon. We don't discriminate against men here. We're in the right, and we should fight. Judy nodded gravely. 
Roger, I understand your recommendation, and in other circumstances, I would agree. But we can't settle this. If you don't fight when you're right, when do you fight? Roger remained characteristically impassive. I hear you three for now. We can we. We can revisit the settlement question at any point. I am asking you to keep an open mind. We've been lawyers long enough to know that being in the right, he made air quotes with his nimble fingers, doesn't guarantee a, su a successful result, nor is it a very good reason to go forward in litigation. But for now, I'll accept your judgment, as I must. Good. Benny rubbed her hands together, taking her seat. Now that we need to... Now what we need to do is finalize the answer. I was going to say that, Roger interrupted, and go full steam ahead on legal research, on the legal research that we started. I was going to say that too. Roger shot Benny a look. Who's running this case? Who do you think Benny shot back with a cocky smile? Huh. Roger laughed. And I take it we agree on the need to utilize Isaac's services. We need him now more than ever. John's departure raises questions we need to address in this media, in the media. Fine, Benny said reluctantly. Okay, Judy nodded. Uh, sure. Mary answered, but she was silently distracted. She didn't want to say out loud, but she felt a warm dampness in her underwear, which during a pregnancy could mean trouble. Roger smiled. Excellent. Isaac nodded. Thank you for your confidence in me, ladies. Mary rose nervously. Excuse me, a, excuse me a minute, bathroom run.